the once everything you know started started happening, did you realize at the time um, that that movie would be as big as it was? Oh heck no, and nobody did. You know, nobody did because you have to remember that movie. Uh, that movie came out right after uh, what's the name of that movie that Wesley did? Wesley um, Wesley Snipes uh, that gangster movie. Not New Jack City. New Jack City. It okay. came out after uh, about a month, maybe after New Jack City, and and the theaters had had the shootings in there, and so the so the uh, so Hollywood was very leery of black projects going into movie theaters anyway. Right. And so they they really didn't promote it because I was watching uh, a film. I had gone to the movies and I saw the trailer for the Five Heartbeats. And I watched the trailer and I said to myself, if I didn't know what this movie was about, would I go see that movie? And I had to answer mm-hmm. myself and say, no. It was the most horrendous trailer you know you could imagine. So that movie went into the theaters. It made five million dollars, and they yanked it after two weeks. It made no money in the theaters. But once mm. it hit video, it's a it took a whole different life. It became a yeah. life of its own. Yeah. And to this day, it's like that movie came out yesterday. Yeah, definitely. Five, and they still five, play it. Yeah, five and six year old kids know the movie because their aunts, their uncles, their grandparents, their mothers, their fathers watch the movie, and so they sit there and watch it with them. So that movie, <laughs> yeah, that's true. It, it's amazing. So that's yeah. 1991. And exactly. To, and it's, it's 2020 now, and it's like it just came out, like you said. Absolutely. But what you have to see, uh, Robert's got this documentary, and now it's finally streaming everywhere. It's on, I think okay. it's on that. It's streaming, but it's called Making the Five Heartbeats. It's oh, yeah. fascinating. It's fascinating. You have to see that because it, it, it really goes into detail about how the struggle he had to make that movie. And it really is amazing that the movie actually got made, but it's through the Robert Townsend's determination that that movie got made. And you have, you have to see it because the five heartbeats were originally not the same guys. They were Denzel and, and, and Keenan Ivory Wayans and, and, and uh, 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 other people. Just think about mm-hmm. how different that movie would have been with those names and with those names in that, as opposed to the cast that the movie had. Exactly, exactly. That's true. Um, and um, I don't think a lot of people, you know, realize that you know, even though Robert starred and he also directed the movie and, and helped write it too. Oh no, he yeah yeah he he. What, what happened, I think what happened was is uh, Keenan and Robert initially wrote it, but Keenan okay. got, uh, because of the fact that it was it took so long, Keenan got to, uh, in living color, so he left the project to Robert, and Robert, mm. Robert took the project, because initially it was a straight-up comedy, but Robert went on the road with the Dells, and he got a lot of, a lot of stories and stuff, and he came back and rewrote it. And, and then, okay. on top of that, he allowed. I, I wrote. I wrote some of my stuff in in that film. I wrote that funeral. Oh, okay. Thing. Yeah, because because that funeral thing, like I say, was when I was in London, I fell in love with a play called Richard the Third, Shakespeare's Richard the Third, and in that play, okay. the um, Richard kills the king. Richard is a hunchback, you know, crippled guy. He kills the king, and over the casket, over the king's casket, he woos Lady Anne, who was the king's wife. And he married her. So that was fascinating to me. So cut, cut the, when we were doing the five heartbeats, I wasn't originally in the way Robert wrote it. I wasn't in the funeral scene. Well, during rehearsals, I went to Robert and I said, I need to be in a funeral scene. And Robert right. said, yeah, you do. Yeah. So we, as we start, they started shooting the film. And Robert never wrote anything for me in a funeral scene. So that the night before the funeral scene was going to be shot, I sat down and I wrote that that scene between me and Eleanor, uh, and that's based, that's based on Shakespeare. That because in my mind, my backstory in the, in the film for me, just as an actor, nobody you know, it's not written in the film. I'm so okay. mad at Jimmy because Eleanor was originally mine and he stole her from me. Mm-hmm. Now that's my backstory. 
So I wrote this whole thing about uh, uh, that you see in film for the funeral scene, and and we shot in the morning. We had shot um, the scene at the house with me and Jimmy, and on the way back to shoot the, at the, go to the church to shoot that scene, I had this piece of paper that I had written out in front of me, and Robert sitting behind me in the car, and the producer sitting on the other side, and I'm holding this piece of paper, wondering should I should I show Robert? Should I tell him this is what I need? And finally, I said to hell with it. I said, I handed it back. I said, hey, Robert, this is what I need to say in the funeral scene. And mm-hmm. so when he read it, all he did was edit it down. Because I've written a little bit more than what you see. But I wrote that. Okay. You know, and Robert oh, okay. allowed us to do things like that. Because Robert allowed the actors to be the freedom to create. It's, it's mm-hmm. like there's certain little things. It's like when I speak French to Eleanor, that's not written in the script. I went to Robert mm-hmm. and said, Robert, can I say this line in French? And he, he initially said, no, 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 no it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And so I went back and forth with him and said, come on, man, let me have this. Let me have this. And finally he said, okay, go ahead and do it. And, okay. and what I say to her is, Eleanor, tu es plus belle que jamais. Now, I have just got to talking to the boys at the table, and I just got to saying, I'm just an old country boy. Right. Well, all of a sudden, I turn around and I start speaking French. Well, that mm-hmm. should tell you, this ain't no old country boy. Exactly. That's, that's, that's one level. Then it establishes immediately a relationship between me and Eleanor because she right. understands what I'm saying. She speaks French, I speak French. Then on the third level, it cuts her husband out of the conversation because he doesn't speak French. Right. So one line establishes who Big Red is. Yeah. You know, so, so those little things, I mean, and throughout the whole, I could, I could go on with stories about that, but those are the things that I'm talking about. And as an actor, as a performer, you have to constantly work and study at the craft to make, the, make your character, you know, something special. And that's what I take pride in. Every movie that you've ever seen me in, I hope you never saw the same character. Oh, I, I, I doubt it. I, I work really hard to make sure you don't see the same person. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be just known as the guy who does one person. I, every film, right. every role. When I was doing extra work, I did a film called Hero Ain't Nothing But a Sandwich. And I was an extra. And, and they have an exterior shot. And you can see me way in the distance. And I laugh about it to this day. I haven't seen it in many years. But as mm-hmm. an extra, I had me a little role. I was walking down the street and I had me a limp because that's what this, that's what this guy on the street would have. He'd have a limp. So right, I, right. <laughs> even, even though you can't see me, I can see me way in the distance, but it doesn't matter. I'm creating myself. Right. That's, right. That's fun. That's what I do. So yeah. you'll never see it, it, again. It's funny the way you said, um, you you created the backstory for yourself in the in the uh, five heartbeats, um, and I think too that it, it was kind of hinted at, uh, maybe not your particular backstory, but it was hinted at somewhat the way Eleanor snatched away from you when you kissed her hand, and not only that, but when uh, Jimmy said, you know, Ray, what's going on? You know, as if there was a previous history, so that was already hinted at as well. Yeah, yeah. All of it has to work together. It's, it's like uh, well, that. That um, it wasn't written. With the way it was written was the nine to five line. I say mm-hmm. it, and that's how the scene ends. It ends on me saying it. Now think about if if the scene ended with just me saying it, as opposed to in rehearsal. I you know we were, we were rehearsing it, and I said, well, what do you do with children that you want to teach them a lesson? Mm-hmm. You make them repeat what you say. What did I say to you? And you make them That's say right. So, so in rehearsal, I, I, I just as we were rehearsing, I just went to Roy and we were doing the scene. And I said, my office hours are. And, and Roy just looked at me, didn't say anything. And then I looked at him in the eye and I said, my office hours are. And he picked up on it and he repeated it. That's how it came mm-hmm. about. So, so when we shot the film, think about the difference if, if, if the scene had ended on me saying it as opposed to Roy on the ground saying it. 
Right, That's right. What made that scene. It's Roy saying it. Mm-hmm. That's what it makes, makes it powerful. It makes a difference. Yeah. It makes a whole lot of difference. You have a grown man who is beat down, who's just like a child now. Yeah. That's the power of that scene. You have a man, Big Red, who controls, who takes mm. the breath out of anybody he comes into. That's what makes that's what makes Big Red. Yeah, so, definitely. So yeah, you understand how how if if you if you get into that character and you work at it and you flesh it out, you constantly dig at it. That's what makes things great. Mm-hmm. And I think it was it was um you know very interesting to see even hearing you talk about it now to see how you got into the role um one thing that i wanted to know too in that funeral scene when you go up to eleanor she slaps you was that slap real or was that just put on for the for the camera oh, oh come on man that was that was 30 times she slapped me 30 times that day oh and she did problem, okay and the problem is she's right-handed and she had her gloves in her right hand, so she used her left hand to slap me. Mm. Now, every time we did a different take of it, all I kept thinking was, oh, please, Lord, don't let her hit me in my ear. Please don't let her hit me in my ear. And right. finally, finally, Robert, we got to the last slap. She slapped me, and Robert said, cut, okay, moving on. And then he said, no, what? no, let's do it one more time. And sure enough, <laughs> on that last time... <laughs> She caught me in the ear, and my my ear rang for about two hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Now that now that's hilarious. But how was that? I was working with Diane Carroll. You know, she was such a, a, a legendary um, actress, and, and and speaking about classy, that she is pretty much one of the definitions of being classy. How was that working oh, with her? Well, there's no doubt about it. See, we didn't. We we actually weren't on the set except for that scene together at, at all. Okay, uh, okay. I never had much interplay. We didn't talk, you know, uh, at all. But she was just one of those people that you look at her and watched her demeanor, and she was the definition of class. Absolutely, mm. the definition of class. And yes, I, I, yes. I, I loved her ever since. And I tell everybody, you want to know, you if there's one movie you want to see. That would that, that would tell you why we're in the condition that we one of not the reason but one of the big reasons why we're in the condition that we that we're in is watch mm-hmm. her in Claudine. That's one of the greatest oh, yes. movies ever. Yes, yes, yes. And that tells you what happened in the seventies and why the breakup of the black family because the mm-hmm. government knew what they were doing. They took the black man out of the family on yeah. purpose. On purpose. Mm-hmm. But Diane um, Carroll's work, you know, is I, I think pretty much everything that she did was legendary. It's, it's, she's just like one of those people that it, when you say the name, somebody already knows. It's kind of like Cicely Tyson at this point. Now, you already pretty much know just from hearing the name. Um, right. And and yeah. that was major for her to be in that. To me, for her to be in that film and. It, it was funny to see, uh, not laughing funny, but it was funny to see that funeral scene because, you know, you just explaining how you did the backstory and now here you is, the person responsible, or here Big Red is the person responsible for having her husband killed and now he's he's in here crying and saying how sorry he is. Yeah, exactly. And trying to get her back. And right, so right. The, Therefore, that's a direct line to that's a direct link to Shakespeare. So you, mm-hmm. that's what I tell kids all the time too. Read, read, read and study, read and study, because you never know how you're going to be able to put things together. You never know where inspiration is going to come from. You just right. observe, be an observer of the world. It's like I, I watch people all the time. Because I never know, oh, that's a little quirk I might be able to use for a character one day. The way they blink mm-hmm. their eyes, the way, the way they walk, the way they talk. I was, I was doing a film in New York called uh, The System Within, and my driver was Jamaican. And, I was, and, and when I got the script, I was trying to put this character together, trying to figure out, oh, who is this guy? What is this guy? This guy? And my driver was Jamaican, and, I, and he was driving me around for two weeks. 
And the day before we started shooting, all of a sudden it hit me. Oh, I know who this guy is now. He's a Jamaican. Uh-huh. Now I've been riding around with, with Jamaican dude for all this time, and it never put and never. But all of a sudden I realized, oh yeah, that'll work. So you never, and I've been watching him. I've been listening to him speaking, all that kind of stuff. But it never, it never, you know, clicked with the being that character Jamaican, and it right, finally right. clicked. So you never know. So I've watched all the time. I study people. I read. I'm just, I'm just not watching, you know, you know, fool. I'm, I'm, I'm watching educational shows. I'm watching, you know, science shows, and I'm watching all kinds of different things. Yeah, and you have to because you, like you say, you you're studying or not studying, but you're constantly learning. So I mean, you have to have something to to learn from because if, if of course if we just watch some of these reality shows now, that that's not really gaining substance. That's just entertainment. So you have to be able to have something to draw from that's substantial. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and it's been, uh, you know, I, I'm going to go ahead and move on from the, the five heartbeats. But one thing I did want to ask you too um, is, did you do you keep in touch with any of the uh, cast? I I see. Uh, uh, my my birthday was on the first of May, and Michael Wrights okay. is on. The well, happy belated 30th. birthday. Oh well, thank you. And Michael Wrights is on the eighth of thirtieth. So I I missed Michael's birthday this year for the first time in many years. So I usually talk to Michael. But you know, now once every two years, I run into Tico, who the guy who played Choir Boy. Choir Boy, yeah. Um, uh, I just run into him every once in a while. I when we, when Robert was doing the making uh, the documentary, I talked to Robert like, once every couple of weeks or so because of the fact that we because we did the interviews and stuff, and so he was trying to coordinate all that stuff. But not really. We don't we don't keep in touch. Matter of fact. Okay. Was, uh, there was a guy here in Vegas, uh, a bartender at one of the one of the casinos I used to go to, and uh, mm-hmm. he's, I, think he, I think he's Hawaiian. But he one day he said to me, he said, "Could you? I, I I just got a poster of the Five Heartbeats. Could you get the guys to sign it?" And I said, "Oh yeah, no problem." So I thought I'd be able to get them together and get you know have have them sign this poster. It turned into yeah. a year and a half odyssey. Because, wow! <laughs> because it spread out all over the place, and I thought Michael Wright would be the the worst one to get, because he was in New York at that time, and he was, mm-hmm. he was actually wound up being the first one I got to sign the poster. So um, I I got to uh, Harry Lennox who played uh, played Dresser, who uh, mm-hmm. lives in New York because he's doing well. He well he's doing a TV show. He's doing the black black blacklist or something like that. So okay. I actually went to New York and did a film in New York, and I finally, after after eight months, got Harry to uh, to sign the poster. And it took me several days in New York to get to him. And then he said, "Oh, give me the poster." Uh, Leon comes to my house every Sunday to watch football, so okay. I gave him the poster. Uh, and I had three of them, and I gave him the posters for for Leon to sign. And I didn't get those posters back. It took about four to five months for me to get those posters back. <laughs> well, Leon, and I finally, Leon signed it. And then I, uh, Tico, choir boy, lives out here in, L- in L.A. And I finally ran up on Tico and got him to sign it. And the last one to sign it, I had, I had the poster. We, Robert got me uh, to go on the, because they were doing the 25th anniversary of the Five Heartbeats. Uh, right, right. They, they were doing a cruise, uh, Tom joined his cruise, so Robert got me to go on the cruise. And mm-hmm. then they, then he did the, Tom joined us a family reunion. So Robert got me to go on, the, on to the family reunion, which was in Orlando. So I took the posters down to Orlando, and I carried them around for two days, and not realizing that Robert left that night. I had people would walk up to me and say, what is, what is, in, those, what is in the box you carry around all this time? And they were the posters. <laughs> So, I did, so it took me another two months, and I finally got right when we, I was doing the interview for the for the documentary. He finally signed them that day, so he was the last one. So it was a it was a year and a half for me to get five mm. signatures. 
So, but I gave the I gave the box in the heads, and I have two posters, two signed posters that I had framed. So that was the <laughs> journey. I mean, that's how I, you know, because everybody has their own life. So me thinking exactly, I was going to exactly. get this done within a month. Shoot, man, this turned into a year and a half. <laughs> you you went in a maze at that point. <laughs> oh man, I, and and it, 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 the quest for me, it was my quest. It was like the quest yeah, for the Holy yeah. Spirit, the quest to get these posters signed. <laughs> That's right. So I wanted to know too, though. Do you ever get tired of people coming up to you saying my office hours are from nine to five? Never, 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 never. Because what I'd be worried about is when they stop coming up to me. Oh, does because that make sense? <laughs> that's that's for me. I mean, I, other actors say, "Wow, well, I man, I'm tired. I don't want to be my black." Blah blah blah. Okay, that's that's on you. But for me, that's a blessing. Just think about that. That film came out in 1991, and people still come up and know me from that film. Then that mm-hmm. means I did my job. That's what I, that's what pleases me. I did my job. Right. I affected people. That means I did it right. I did it the right way. So no, I don't mm-hmm. get tired. Of it. I, I tell you, I tell you something else. It's, it's. There are times, and I've to, I told you I was almost homeless. But there were other times when I've been half broke, and I'd be standing at the gas station wondering, you know, um, counting out my change, trying to figure out how much my how much gas I can get in my car, fifty cents, a dollar, dollar and a quarter. Mm-hmm. And some homeless person will walk up to me, and I'm I'm, sta- I'm standing there thinking to myself, why am I putting myself through this? I was accepted in law school, and I was accepted into Notre Dame's law school, and I decided not to go because that's not what where my passion was. But I'd be thinking, right. to myself, I could have gone to law school. Why am I doing this? And some homeless mm-hmm. person will walk up and say, Yo, man, I really like that work you do. You really represent. Keep it up, and they'll walk away. Mm-hmm. They don't understand how important they were to me at that moment in my life. Because now I can look at and smile and say, okay, suck it up. Let's move on. It's okay. Mm-hmm. We can go. And, and that's happened several times in my life. That's not just once. It's those people, they don't understand how black people have no clue. And I say this to black people all the time. I love black people because you're the ones that have kept me going throughout all this nonsense throughout all these years. Because mm-hmm. you're the one who let me know how important I am in your life. And I right. really appreciate you for that. Because without you, I am nothing. I'm, mm-hmm. st- I'm, I'm still that kid. From, I'm, in, in my mind, I'm still that kid from the south side of Chicago. And I'm living my dream. And, right, and you know, right. every time somebody comes up and asks me to take a picture with them, it's like, you want a picture with me? To this <laughs> To this day, I'm just, I'm just, it just, it lifts me to right. understand. Because yeah, I'm that kid because, from Chicago. And, and they don't understand. I mean, um, some, sometimes what's, what's, it's not hard to understand, but even even playing Big Red, you were the villain in the movie. And people from that role probably say, you know, I can't stand him. I don't like him, you know from the movie, but when they see you, they love you just from playing that role, or any role, really. Oh, that happens all the time. Yeah, I read, I read mm-hmm. stories about that. I read people's comments about that. I, I, uh, I, people have said to me, uh, I, I didn't want to come up to you, and, 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 and finally I got enough nerve, or, or I've seen you two, three times you know, out of the club, and I was scared to come up to you, and I finally got the courage. I had one girl say, mm-hmm. Uh, um, one one girl who I was in a club in Orlando, she she wanted to come up and say hi, and her and she but she wouldn't. And finally, her uh, her relatives, her I think it was her best friend and and her cousin or somebody, finally okay. said, "There's a guy over here that's looking at you, and if you don't go up to Big Red and say something to him, we're gonna tell that guy you're in love with him." <laughs> and that's what made her come up to me. Wow. Because she wasn't coming, but her relatives made her come. So, you know, that happens all the time. You know, uh, mm-hmm. that's why I'm very aware of my surroundings. Because I've had people come up and hit me in the back. Not from Big Red, but from, from something else I had done previously. And, mm-hmm. and so I'm very aware of my surroundings. Because people really believe that stuff. 
Yeah, they I get attached the, to the character. Yeah, but I was the but they but but the, uh, that's that's what puts a, another smile on my face. The fact that every role that I do, people believe it because I, I me and me and the guy uh, producer who produced those films I did in New York. Uh, one the one I told you about uh, the system within, and the other one called the Stick Up Kid. We were mm-hmm. in Vegas, and and I had done this film with Snoop called Bossin Up, in which I play a okay. pimp, and I teach him, uh, Snoop how to be a pimp. Okay. So we were, we were sitting down at, at the, in the lounge, and these two girls came over and sat down across from us, and it turns out mm-hmm. they're prostitutes. And so, oh, wow. so 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 my friend, uh, so uh, Tariq Tariq Alexander, leaned over and said, "Let's let's let's have some fun with these girls." So he started mm-hmm. talking about, uh, "You got to choose. You want you you want you know you got to choose. You want we'll be we'll be your pimp. If you want if you want a new pimp, I, you know." That will be the pimp. And right, so the right. Girls, and so that one girl leaned over to the other girl, and she said, she she said to uh, to her girlfriend, she said, "See, my pimp told me he was a pimp. She actually believed <laughs> that I was a pimp <laughs> because they had seen bossing up, and her pimp believed mm-hmm. that I was a real pimp. That's how much belie- believability, how much credibility I have in those roles." And that makes yeah. me smile. That's what I do. And that's what yeah. the whole purpose of it is, to make people believe that's who you are. Right, right. And it shows your, your, your versatility, and it shows how you know, deep you are or how invested you are in the character that you play. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what important i i personally believe when you're playing a role because who wants to see you play something that they can't believe you know exactly. it's like that you know it make it doesn't make sense because it's almost like well why are you doing it if i can't believe that it's you exactly. and why are you wasting my hour and a half time i want to have i'll never get back right right exactly so it, it just shows how dedicated you are to the craft that you're doing and you know whether it was a small role or whether it was a big role, you still knocked it out the park and you still delivered. And and that's one thing, if nothing at all, you know, people I'm sure will still remember you for it no matter what. Um, and, and so much so, and that's something else I want to talk about too. Um, you know, Big Red became like a big role and it became a classic, but did you find yourself like being typecasted off of that kind of stuff? Actually not. Because okay. it wasn't, it wasn't immediate. All, because white people run Hollywood, honestly. right? You right. Know, we, we all know that. That wasn't the film that they watched. Okay. It, it, so, so no, it didn't typecast me, in 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 in, the, in that sense, because it's like mm-hmm. that. I, after that, I did I did like the Speed, and and then I did a film like a Dallas Baldwin film. I've done a lot of different. A lot of different stuff. People people think that I only play bad guys, but uh, but because bad guys have a, a more of an impact on people's lives, so they remember them more than than somebody playing a good guy. Good guy, and, right? Right. Yeah. So uh, hit it dead on the so, head. Yeah, but I play. I've I've been blessed in the fact that I've played all kinds of roles. You know, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. You know, different different people from killers to you know to congressmen, whatever it may be. So out of all the roles that you played, do you have a favorite role uh, thus far? No, all of my are my favorites. Okay. <laughs> I mean, okay. They're, they're different. They're different for different reasons. I mean, of course, five heartbeats because it took me to a whole different level. Speed right. because it was such a big film. Uh, seven because it was a big film, and you know, even though it was a smaller role, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, Disco Godfather, I, I love that role, and my one of my favorite roles, which is they screwed it up, was that film with Alec Baldwin called Heaven's Prisoners, and mm-hmm, that was the mm-hmm. most, that was the most disappointing up until lately. I got another film that I did that disappoints because they screwed it up. It's about Flint, but that's a whole story. I won't even get into that. But Heaven's okay. Prisoners. <laughs> Heaven's Prisoners, I, 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 I love the character and I love what I did in the film. But what happened was, uh, and, and I found this out 
later in the process. I went to do some looping, I went to do some ADR, some vocal replacement, uh, and post production work. And the director looked at me and he said, you know, we had to cut a lot of your stuff out. You know, don't be mad, don't be upset, but we had to cut a lot of your stuff out. And I said, why? He said, because, and he, he hummed and hollered for a little bit, but he finally told me, he said, you made Alec look like a punk. Mm-hmm. So, because I did my job, and I was counting on that film to take me to a whole different level. But right, Alec right. Bowen had, had 10 films after that to do. He didn't, he didn't need that film. I needed that film. But I got cut exactly. out because I did my job. And he didn't do his. So that that hurt me a lot. That that one really hurt because that that scene that that, that we we shot it out with each other. They they talk about how bad this character is. Victor, his name was Victor Romero, and mm-hmm. and everybody talks about the mess with Victor. Don't mess with Victor. So that scene where where I was talking about in the front of my laundry, we shot at each other from the from that from that first floor. All the way through three floors, we were blasting at each other. We were shooting, the water coolers were blowing up, all kinds of stuff. Well, the way they edited it, we went from the first floor almost directly to the third floor, and within 20 seconds, he shoots and kills me. And mm. and it was like, no, you can't do that because it, it, it doesn't make sense. And then the line, because because I killed his his wife, I shotgun her in the mm-hmm. bed. When I'm laying on the ground dying, he, he's trying to figure out who 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 is the people responsible for all of this. And he right. asked me, he said, "Who who who did this?" And and I look at him and I say, "You know, dying." I said, "Did us." And he leans in closer and he said, "What did you say? What did you say?" And I say, "I did, you old lady, motherfucker." And I die. <laughs> well, what a great exit line. I mean, you should right. get better than that. Well, that line is gone. Mm-hmm. Because wow. Alec didn't do his job and react to it. So they cut it out. Mm. And they cut a, a lot of that stuff out. But, you know, it's Hollywood because I've been cut out of stuff before. I've been, I was cut out of some of the stuff was cut out of Cheaters. I was cut out of Frasier. Yeah. Uh, because of the fact that I was funnier than, than the leads are. Mm. So you can't have that. You can't be funnier than, than, than Kelsey Grammer. You can't get right. bigger laughs. Right. You can't, you know, uh, it, it, that's the way Hollywood is. But, yeah. that, but the Heaven's Prison has hurt me. It hurt me to the quick because that's such a great character. Oh, man, if they had put, left all the stuff that was in there, if they had left it in, Oh, man, mm-hmm. what's the name? Uh, we did, uh, me and my my brother came out to visit me, and I and I had produced Remember, oh, it was Remember Me, the film of the two sisters. And they were doing the, uh, a, a thing up in Oakland, uh, an awards, and they asked me to come up for the awards because they were giving me an award for, for that short film. And my brother happened mm-hmm. to be here, so he went up to Oakland with me. He's for, he, was from D, he was living in D.C. at that time, but we flew up together and then they called and said, we want to do reshoots for heaven's prisoners. And so they said, can you do it? I said, yeah. And, but you got to fly me back and stuff. There were no flights after the, after the show, there was so the flight stopped at 10 o'clock. So what they mm-hmm. did was they sent me a private jet to fly me back. So I could be on the set at six o'clock in the morning. What a great oh, flight. Okay. If you've never flown in a private jet, it's like, wow, man, this, this, this is the bomb. Exactly. <laughs> but me, me and my brother came back. He talks about it all the time to this day. But we got on the set, and they had written this new scene because they were trying to fix some stuff. And Terry Hatcher, I don't know if you know who Terry Hatcher is. Yeah. Terry Hatcher was in uh, Housewives, uh, the Housewives show, not, not the mm-hmm. reality show. But uh, but she, but she was played Supergirl or uh, uh, Lois Lane and and one of the Super uh, Super Boy uh, television show. But she wasn't know who Terry Hatcher is. But okay. Terry was was one of the leads in the film, and she she and I had to sing together. They wrote for us together, and she was screwing it up. She was screwing her lines. 
and mm. and she couldn't remember, you know. So it was it was a long day. But finally, one of the crew members came and pulled me aside and said, "You know why she's messing up? Because she thinks you're so good. She's just worried that she can't keep up with you." Mm. So of course, that whole scene is gone now. Right. Right. You know, wow. but that, that didn't come from me. That's not me saying that. That's from a crew member who she had, who she, he had overheard her talking to somebody. Right, right. Of course, it, I, I believe it because that, it happens, it, it happens a lot. And like you said, you're just coming in to do your job, but you're not even thinking about what somebody else is doing or how they, you know, thought process is. You're just coming in to do what you know how to do. And no, no, I, that I didn't come over. No. And I'll tell you one more. This last one I'm going to say. Let's talk about this. I was doing a film okay. with um, Linda Hamilton. Linda is the Terminator woman. Okay, okay. Uh, and she and I were doing this film called uh, uh, Black Moon Rising. And she and I are car thieves. And, and we're partners. And one night, we, we made a big score because we got the crew together and we stole out of the showrooms, we stole Mercedes, we stole Benzes, we stole Rolls Royces, all these high-end cars, Porsches, all this stuff. We, I mean, we made a killing that night. So we're sitting okay. in the van in the front seat, and we're laughing and joking with each other and just having a great, great old time because we're high on the fact that we got away with this. So the only thing all day long, the director, the only thing the director would say to, to us was, don't be so sexual. Don't be so sexual. That's, that's the only direction we got all day long. And we would look at each other and, and couldn't figure out what is he talking about? What does he mean? Well, right, right. So come to see the film comes out. Of course, I'm cut out of it. And, and, but I watched the film and I figure out and I realized what he was talking about. Tommy Lee Jones was her love interest in the film. Okay. They had absolutely no chemistry whatsoever. It was it was so bad. It was terrible. She and I had all the chemistry. She and I should have been I should have been playing that role. And then wow. it dawned on me. But because I'm doing my job, I get cut out of another movie. Mm-hmm. And you're not even thinking about, you know, what what it is that that you know they're seeing now because you like you said you're just doing your job. Yeah. Mm-mm. So, yeah, it, it, it's crazy. It is crazy, man. <laughs> but I, I also want to talk to you. Um, of course, you know, we, we talked about you being an actor, but I want to talk about some of your um, directing and writing. Uh, of course, like you said, some of the short films that you've been writing and uh, movies as well. And, you know, I, I want to talk about some of that stuff. And what are you working on now? Well, right now, we're working on getting a film company together. And we've been working on it for quite a long time. It's called Raging Lion. And okay. once this money comes together, I, I will have, uh, I will play a prominent role. I'll be, matter of fact, I'll be head of production. I'll be president of production once the money comes through. But, but it's Raging Lion. That's what I'm, that's what we're working on now. And if, when that comes through, man, you're talking about some powerful stuff because I will be in charge of a lot, a lot of stuff and I will have a great input into what we actually produce and we're going to come out strong. And I just, right before I, that, that's what I was talking to when, when, when I, I texted you and said, I'm on the phone. I was talking right. to the CEO of Raising Lion. Uh, oh, okay. So that's, that's, that's why I was a little late getting back to you. But so that, that's what I'm working on now, but the directing and writing, I, I love it. I love to direct. I found out that I know what I'm doing as a director because I directed several commercials, MasterCard commercials, and mm-hmm. I directed a film called The Stick Up Kids, uh, uh, which is about which was shot in New York, and um, it's just and I and I wrote part of the script, and it's just okay. a wonderful experience. And I was also in it, but I was able to say things, powerful things about black men you know, from our perspective. So if you get a chance, see the film called The Stick Up Kids, K-I-D-S, mm-hmm. The Stick Up Kids. Tariq Alexander was the producer. It's uh, You can download it. It's all over the internet. 
But the other two films that are on YouTube, the short films are called, one's called Remember Me with a question mark, and the other is okay. called um, uh, uh, Lisa Trotter. So if you, if you get, get a chance to see those two films and, and the Stick Up Kids, those are things that, as a director, I directed the Stick Up Kids and, 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 and wrote, uh, uh, wrote uh, uh, Remember Me. And the guy who wrote uh, Lisa Trotter is Sam Greenlee, who passed away several years ago. But Sam wrote The Spook Who Sat By The Door. Okay. And so he wrote he wrote this film called Lucy Trotter and, and I did it as a short film so that I once again trying to raise money to do the whole feature. But go on YouTube and watch those two films. Uh Lisa Trotter, T uh Lisa L I S A Trotter, T R O T T E R and mm-hmm. remember me. And if you punch in my name on YouTube and you you pull up because there's a couple things called called uh uh there's something called the stick of kids or something, but you if you punch my name in you'll see it. Uh, okay. And, and remember me with the question mark because there's, there's something else called remember me without the question mark. But you have to put my name in and it should come right up. So remember me, Lisa Trotter, and the Stick Up Kids. Okay, sounds good. I'm definitely going to check those out, and everybody else that's listening, I hope they check those out as well. Um, I do want to thank you so much, uh, Mr. James, for doing this today. Um, and before I let you go, though. Um, let everybody know where they can find you as far as social media or your websites, anything that you have. Okay. Uh, I'm on, I'm on Facebook. It's just Hawthorne James, H A W T H O R N E James. And on, okay. on Instagram is Hawthorne two nine nine five Hawthorne two nine nine five. Okay. All right. Well, again, thank you so much, Mr. James. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure having this conversation with you and just, you know, learning a little bit about your life and career. Um, and, and thank you so much again. If any, you know, you have any future projects or whatever you're working on, you can send that stuff to me. I'm going to send you my email. Um, and I'll help, you know, put up that stuff and promote it, that kind of stuff too as well. So just let me know. Well, I appreciate that. And it's been a wonderful time. I, I, the time has flown by here. But thank you for yeah, the Yeah, yeah. No problem at all. And, and-